אז ברוכים הבאים כולם, אנחנו נורא שמחים שהצטרפתם אלינו. שמחה לראות פה הרבה הרבה פנים מוכרות, חברים ותיקים וחדשים, והרבה אנשים שמוטרדים מה, מהמציאות העגומה הזאת שנכפתה עלינו. למי שלא מכיר, אני סיגל יניב פלר, אני סמנכ"ל של JFN בישראל ומרכזת את פורום הקרנות הירוקות. I'll just say that we're going to run this session in two languages. We're going to jump back and forth from Hebrew and English. If you're an English speaker and having problems understanding in Hebrew, raise your hand and occasionally we'll stop and try to translate. Some of the speakers will speak in English, um, so we'll kind of go back and forth. So if you'd rather ask a question in English, ask it in English and we can answer in Hebrew or whatever works. So I want to thank you all for joining us today. I just want to remind for those of you who don't know that the Green Funders Forum is one of JFN's pure interest groups. It's an affinity group on the environment in Israel. Um, comprised of funders and foundation professionals based both here and overseas that are interested and um, occupied with the environment in Israel. And the aim of the forum is to bring funders together to learn, to collaborate, to coordinate, and hopefully to be able to have a better and more strategic impact on Israel's environment. So with that in mind, following the news that everything that's been happening over the past week on Israel's coast, um, we decided to hold this emergency session and bring some up-to-date information on what's going on and also hear from people who are on the ground, literally um, fighting the consequences of this oil spill to share what's going on and for us to be able to think what we are actually able to do about it um, as a funding community, as individuals, as citizens of Israel. So with that in mind, I'm handing it over to you, Gil. Or to Marla? Uh, to me. And you will be in charge of admitting people. Okay. Mm. Hi, so thank you for joining. This is really an emergency in Israel. Uh, just to give a brief background, last week, an oil transport ship traveled from Egypt to Greece. That's, that's what's uh, allowed to say at the moment. And, and spilled tons of oil about 50 kilometers off the coast of Israel. Israel's entire shoreline is filled with the tar, oil, waste also washed with the storm. And there are thousands of marine animals dead or in critical condition. Dozens of people already have been injured to some extent. And there is a great concern to the drinking water from desalination plants in Israel since all the coastal line is uh, actually infected. And the consequences are still unfolding and accumulating. So we don't know the full picture, but it looks uh, severe, very severe. Um, uh, fortunately, there are thousands of volunteers that are just joined the mission uh, to clean the, the beaches and they even risk a bit their health and we're trying to prevent that. And there are also local municipalities and governmental authorities trying to uh, respond. Um, there's a big, there's a big, uh, unfortunately, it's a, it's a second hit this year in Israel after uh, COVID. Many people thought that after the vaccination, we'll be able to go outside, enjoy the open spaces and also the, the coastline. And apparently it's not so sure it's gonna happen. And the scarce open spaces that we already have are actually in danger at the moment. Uh, there are also broader aspects that we'll touch uh, today, which are the policy decision-making that will affect the future. And um, which means massive oil pump, pipeline, pipeline from the Gulf of Elat to Ashkelon and drillings of oil and gas in the Mediterranean. And there's, a, there's actually an impressive coalition that just was, was established in just one week with many, many organizations working collaboratively, collaboratively. And this is a good opportunity to hear what's being done on the ground and also to see how can we help. So without further ado, I wanna pass it at, um, to the first speaker. Uh, which is Ruti Ahel, she's the chief um, marine ecologist at the Israel Nature and Parks Authority. And she'll give us a current picture of the damage to marine life and efforts on the ground by the uh, National, National uh, Parks uh, Nature and Parks Authority. So please feel free to drop questions at the chat. I, I really thank Ruti because she, it wasn't clear until the last minute if she can do it, she was uh, uh, called an emergency on Khziv Beach and we're really thankful that she made the time. 
and we hope she could say just a few minutes after, but that's it. So um, thank you, Ruti, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Gil, very, very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So yeah, um, on my way to Achziv, to Rosh Hashanah Marine Protected Area, I tackled uh, another obstacle that reminded reminded me that uh, tar is not our only problem in Israel nowadays. Uh, just a sec. I'll take care of it later, okay? <laughs> um, uh, the, it's not the only problem that we tackle now in Israel. We had a huge, huge traffic jam that uh, it's almost a miracle that I managed to escape out of it. So tar on the beach is only one more obstacle that we have to deal with. So you can see uh, these two pictures that, you know, that tells the entire, uh, the entire story. You can see these um, tiny little marine uh, turtles that are covered with uh, tar that were taken out of the sea. And you can see a seagull on the left side, uh, which was found on the beach. And these, these are just two examples of what we found, what we can find here all along the beaches of Israel these days. Uh, so just, just a quick reminder, last, uh, last week, a week ago, we had a huge storm here, huge in Israeli terms. And between uh, uh, Tuesday and, on, and Wednesday, and on Wednesday morning, we started to realize that there's uh, unusual, unusual quantities of tar that are covering different areas in the, on the beaches. First, we thought it's only in the center of Israel. Then we realized it was expanded to the north of Israel. And later on, uh, during this day and the next morning, we found that the the north part of the Israeli coastline is suffering most of the pollution that was uh, uh, brought brought to us by the sea. So what we we can uh, now discriminate into two uh, uh, into three uh, parts: the sandy beach that was uh, hit and that was uh, covered by, by tar, the rocky beaches, and the sea, the water of the sea. Uh, we can also say that there are things that are damaged, damages that are visual that we can see them right now and we can take care or start to take care or in some, some sort just mitigate the problem, but we still don't know the entire range of the damage. We still don't know what, what is the soluble fraction of the tar in the sea if and how it's going to hurt the entire marine ecosystem by incorporating into the um, phytoplankton, the algae in the sea, the zooplankton, later on the fish, and uh, at the end of the day, at the top predators, it will take us, I assume, few months, if not years, to realize what was, what are the consequences of um, of this uh, event. Uh, the other thing is that we're not sure yet is that there's still pollution in the, the water, that we're still going to get it, and that some of the, the tar that, was, um, still, that is still on the beach is going to, to be flashed back to the sea and flash, flashed back to the beach, and we're going to see it later on in, in the next uh, waves. Uh, just, just a brief estimations of uh, how much tar was uh, collected from the beaches. You can see that uh, in Rosh Nikra, it's almost three. And th this, uh, this, uh, this data are, uh, are drew for uh, yesterday noon, so because we don't have the data from uh, today. So it's, you have to not multiply it, but to add some quantities to that. So you can see that we have just at the north part of Israel almost thousands of bags of tar and it's more than six tons of tar that was, were collected up to now. Um, just, just to some, some way visualize it, the, the, the tar was, uh, was flashed into, into, onto the shore in a very patchy way. So that there are beaches that we can just walk and say, we don't know what we are talking about, it's clean. Or there are some beaches that, like Dora Bonim, that were covered, fully covered with tar last Thursday. And we, um, because of the really good 
work and organization, both of the NPA with a lot, a lot of volunteers. And I think this is, you know, one of the positive points that came out of this event that we have wonderful people around that are re really ready to come and help and recover the beaches. And I don't know what we would do without uh, these people. And it's a very important, it's something very positive to say about the Israeli society, at, you know, generally speaking, but we can see it uh, on this event as well. So you can see the map of Rosh Hashanah and you can see that it wasn't the, the points just um, uh, say how many, how many uh, uh, bags were collected, uh, trash bags, and you can see it's in a real patchy mode. Uh, these, are, these are some of the scenes that we see these days. These are on, on the right side, the, in the top left, these are the scenes that we saw uh, just after the, the storm. And you have just one little positive example of how a beach looks like after uh, it was clean. So, Places that is, you would say they will never be clean, clean the back, uh, back uh, looks good now. Um, we have a very sensitive habitat along the Israeli coastline, which is called the abrasion platforms, um, which, uh, which are led on the intertidal zone. Uh, and we're very, very worried that after the, the storm will, uh, will be passed, we'll see that most of the tar was settled on the, the abrasion platforms and will cover the sensitive area. Luckily enough, the storm was strong enough, so it just flashed all the tar uh, onto the beach just to the further uh, east. And most of these abruption uh, platforms were not hurt. Uh, Oshanikra is an exception because we saw, we see some tar there. Um, this is how it looks on the, on the abrasion platforms. You can see it's not uh, not a nice uh, <laughs> uh, material to deal with. It's very hard to separate from the rocks. And actually, I'm, I'll have to leave right uh, after I speak because we are going to try some chemicals, obviously uh, uh, environmental Freddy chemicals that uh, to just remove the remains of the tar that were already taken from the beach, from the rocks. Um, so this is basically what we see. These are just more maps of the patchiness of the tar on the beach and different examples that show how complicated, although Israel is very small and the shoreline is very short, we have different type of habitats, different uh, type of substrate, and there is no one solution that fits all. We have to find solutions for every every uh, place differently. And the, the idea is that we're not going to hurt the ecological system and more organisms that are sitting attached on, on the uh, rocks and the sandy area. Um, just one thing that I wanted uh, to mention, in addition that we have to, to go and do more surveys in order to estimate the, the damage that uh, um, that was done that the, the way it works in Israel is that when the pollution is still in the sea, this is the responsibility of the Ministry of Environmental Protection. Once it's on the beach, every regional municipality uh, or municipality which is not re regional have to take care of its own beaches. So it takes a lot of work in order to develop the right plans and the right uh, protocols for each type of, uh, of shore and to assimilate it within these local municipalities. We as the Israel uh, Nature Parks Authority take care of the nature reserves and the national mon monuments along the Israeli shoreline. And in addition, we are trying to help and support the other municipalities in order to prioritize nature, archaeology, and other uh, values that we take care of in, in to put them. So we, we come and say, it's not just cleaning the beach uh, for, for the sake of the citizens that will come and run and sit and enjoy, it's just to recover those values back to the sea. So as I said, it will take months, if not years. We were really worried that the damage is much in a much vaster areas that we, than we can see now, but um, we're working with lots of volunteers and people in order to remove 
as much star as we can and, and the faster that we can from uh, the, sea, the coastline. This is it, Gil. So <laughs> that would be. If there are uh, questions, I can take them now. Yeah, we can. I think we can open just for one, two minutes. So we can let Ruthie go continue to work if anyone has any question. Would you like to see stop share screen? She could have me go to the right column gallery. Leah Shela, man is it Betochayam? And you've been she shall be the Kalahupim. Avala la slaim, Vala Dorim Shakurim, Shakurim la Hupim, no evantia die. Man is the king, but come I shall la Sotma Shubanya. So, as I said, it will take a long time because we have, on the beach, it's very, very visual. We can see what's going on, okay? In the sea, we have to, to dive there in order to map uh, the environment, in order to see if there is, and we do have the first indications. Not, <laughs> we were not as lucky as on the abrasion platforms. Uh, we, we can see that there are some tar on the, on the sea floor. Um, uh, a small scale um, a pilot, just, just a trial that we did show that this star is sinking, okay? So if you put it in, in seawater, it, it sinks. So we're worried that there are some areas that we, we will find huge quantities of that on the sea bottom, but it, obviously it will take a long while because it takes, we can dive everywhere. Uh, immediately and we would like to make sure that the sea is safe in order for our divers to get in and check this uh, and these uh, questions. Okay, but so that we'll, that we'll find some. So that Thank you and have a good meeting. Good luck. We Let's that. also say if you have questions, yeah, um, drop it on the chat. Yeah, put them in the chat, and every so often we'll stop and present the questions yeah. to the speakers. So feel free to just use the chat. Okay. Bye bye for the minute. Okay, so our next speaker is the Ari Rosenblum. He's the CEO of uh, Executive Director of Echo Ocean. Echo Ocean was actually founded by uh, Andreas Weil. He's a JFN member and a prominent environmental funder and also a member in our forum. So EcoOcean actually leads the joint effort by civil society to really mobilize thousands of volunteers. They join every day to clean up the beach and save wounded animals, wash the shore and many, many other tasks. So thank you, Arik, for making the time. It's, uh, it's really, I know you're in the midst of everything. And we would love to hear from, from you about how, what's being done now about saving the Israeli coastline and what needs to be done even in the medium term um, to deal with this kind of events. So the floor okay. is yours. Thanks. First of all, thank you for, for inviting me. And it, it's a joint effort. When we talk about ecosystems, um, without Nir, without Ruthie, without all the people that we just, uh, and many others, uh, this wouldn't, uh, you know, the, the type of partial, at least, success that the civic society has been able to deliver would not be possible. I'll say uh, just briefly, um, it, we have three units that we have activated during this uh, event within our organization. The first one is our research vessel, and I'll mention it in a second. The second is our educational programs, and the third is our, our activation of community. Um, I think we've brought a, an additional toolbox to the environmental uh, uh, organizations in Israel where we define ourselves as people that focus on positive activism. And uh, I think the best way to explain it is to explain exactly what happened here in, in this event, why we found ourselves in the place that we did. And I'm sure that we're going to hear from Nir about the, the other sides of of what I'll mention, the talk, the legal sides, the 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 um, the more um, uh, the more uh, activism type of activities that people are used to. So, as most of you probably do know, but I'll just mention it. In 2008, um, a law was created that was supposed to regulate uh, what needs to be done and how to activate the country um, in the case of a uh, oil spill. Um, that law was never passed. And because that law was never passed, it means that right now throughout this whole event, 
the Ministry of Environment that's responsible for uh, for the, the the environment uh, has been fighting this with uh, at least one hand, if not both arms, tied behind their back, um, and that led to the fact where and and throughout these years, organizations like Savra Laganat Teva, like Adam Teva Vadin, like Salul and others, have been fighting to to push for that law to to become into being. Our part began to happen when we looked at the situation, we saw it's not happening. Let's use our tools. And our tool was we went to the Ministry of Environment. We said two, two years ago, we said, look, you haven't been able to pass the law. We read your plan. There are two things that we can do. And we'd like to begin to do them. And we need your collaboration, cooperation. By the way, not their money. It's all donor based. And, and that was one. Today, at this point in time, our research vessel is the, is the first response vessel for the state of Israel in the case of a oil spill in the country, because they don't yet have ships that they can use. They have a giant ship that, that only leaves the port at certain times, and that's not the kind of ship they need for these kinds of emergencies. And the second thing we offered them, we said all, or, all over the world, volunteers, are, the, are the, 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 the main force needed to, to do a beach cleans and to help resolve at least part, part of the issue. So we uh, established something that's called the National Network of, of, uh, uh, of uh, Volunteers for Marine uh, Emergencies. And two years ago, we already started in the process, which meant that we went to every one of the 22 municipalities in the country. We sat with them along with the Ministry of Environment, looked over their, their emergency plans for the sea. And then we established in each and every one of them, some to a larger extent, others to a smaller extent. Again, we're still in the middle of the program. A, a group of 20 volunteers in each municipality that these volunteers are what we call professional volunteers. It's like a, a volunteer firemen. These are people that we trained according to international courses. And that's where our education team came in in, in order to prepare them in, to help the municipality and the government in the case of an event. All this was happening where we also knew that stage three, it would be that we need to, uh, to create an infrastructure for the volunteers ad hoc, the, the masses that will come in in case there's a, an event. Um, and then this happened. And when this happened, um, basically what we did is on the 17th, which was the Wednesday that Ruthie described, our 250 volunteers that are trained volunteers with expertise at a, of a high level, went out, it was during a storm, went out all along the, co the country with representatives of the 22 municipalities and began to help to identify the, the amount of effort and, and, and focus of where we need to bring the, the volunteers in the, in the end. The second thing was we began to open up um, our, our national uh, a phone a phone number uh, a place to place to uh, find information, and we began to gather the volunteers in an organized manner, and to send those volunteers information, the contact information of the municipalities that are doing the work, and and all those all those things. We are today almost on a daily basis, definitely during the weekends and in the afternoons are handling about 11,000 volunteers. I wanna just take it back for a second and say, what would have happened if we hadn't been prepared with this is that you can imagine all the good people that wanted to do good and go to the beach, that it would have all gone to the beaches in, in, a, you know, in their own free time and way. They would have begun to clean up the beach in whatever form and way they thought. Um, the municipalities, instead of cleaning the beaches, would have had to uh, um, get help to organize and control the masses coming to the beach. And what would have happened was many people would have, not just the, the five or six people that um, uh, were hurt by the fumes 
of, of, the, of the tar, but we would have been talking about hundreds of people being harmed. So what instead happened was that in a very organized fashion, in complete collaboration with the municipalities, where, where volunteers are needed, we send the volunteers out to the field and, and, we, um, and we get the work done with them. Also training, this is by the way, to make sure that there's the equipment they need, that they're protected, that, that uh, uh, everyone knows what needs to happen. They understand it isn't like a beach clean for, uh, for cigarettes and for plastic. This is a, a chemical that, that's, that can be dangerous. And um, by the way, we're preparing right now. It's what we're in the middle of right now. We're expecting many people for the weekend. And, and so we're working very hard on, on making that happen. Uh, just the last comment, we're also in preparation to send supplies uh, to, um, besides the fact that we're already sending supplies of, a, of this kind of equipment that you're seeing to municipalities that do not have the money for it. This is all through donors, by the way. We're also preparing to send uh, supplies to the Gaza Strip and perhaps to Lebanon if there'll be a way to, to do that. Thank, that's, and that's it. Thank you, Arik. There is a question for wow, how can we be in touch with the ocean? So uh, maybe just uh, say a couple of words about that. Um, well, first of all, Echo Ocean, we're on the Facebook, we have a website, everyone's welcome to connect uh, and volunteer. We'll, we'll, we'd love to have you. And of course, if you personally are coming, I, I know a lot of you and, and I, I will be happy to brief you personally uh, about the information, about things that are going on. Um, you know, the information is very, very open. Okay, thank you, Arik. Uh, I think uh, one of the questions in the chat actually leads us to the next uh, speaker, uh, which will talk about the, how to prevent future dangers and how to change the policy about oil in general and gas drilling and oil drilling. So that's why we invited the, the next speaker, Nir Papai. Uh, Nir Papai is the Berbe Ivrit. Just for the background in English, um, Nir Papai is the deputy CEO of the Nature uh, Protection at the Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel. And he will share the joint efforts to stop uh, really irreversible decisions that are being considered right now, which are basically oil and gas, and also a new agreement with the Emirates about an oil pipeline from Elat to Ashkelon with many, many ships uh, shipping oil, which is exactly the problem that we see now. As uh, Nir Abamashelcha, כמוזמן <laughs> אבל ביד שנייה אנחנו אומרים לעצמנו שמשבר הוא גם הזדמנות. ואנחנו, ואני לא מדבר על הצד הכספי, סליחה, אני מדבר יותר על שינוי מדיניות, ואנחנו יכולים לראות את האירועים הקשים שהיו בשנים האחרונות, אם זה בעקבות האירוע באשלים, בנחל אשלים, הצלחנו להעביר חקיקה אה, שקשורה לשינוי חוק מפגעים סביבתיים לפגיעה בערכי טבע, למשל, בעקבות הרעלת הנשרים הקשה שהייתה ברמת הגולן, הצלחנו לקדם, לצערי עדיין לא עבר סופית, אבל חוק נגד הרעלות. ולכן צריך להגיד שמשבר זה גם הזדמנות וגם במקרה הזה. אני חושב שכולכם נחשפתם שכבר ב-2008 יש החלטת ממשלה שישראל צריכה להיערך לאירועי זיהום. לצערנו, מתי הדבר הזה עובר? הנה, החלטת ממשלה אתמול להקצות 45 מיליון לניקוי החופים, ותוך 30 יום להביא הצעת חוק. חבל שחיכינו 13 שנה, ולכן אנחנו צריכים לחשוב צעד אחד קדימה ולחשוב בדיוק להתמקד בדברים שהמדינה לא, להקדים את המדינה בצעד אחד כ-NGO ולהשפיע ולהקדים תרופה למכה. אז ברשותכם אני אציג את האתגרים שאנחנו, שאנחנו כארגוני סביבה, אני מדבר בשם ארגוני הסביבה בכלל, מדברים בים התיכון ובמפרץ אילת. אז אני אתחיל עם הים התיכון. והמפה הזאת היא מפה שבדרך כלל לא מכירים אותה, אבל זה קו החוף, אני מראה את קו החוף של ישראל, מפרץ חיפה. תמיד אנחנו מדברים רק על החלק היבשתי, 
אבל יש לנו גם חלק ימי, החלק הטריטוריאלי, המים הטריטוריאליים, כ-20 קילומטר מהחוף, שהחקיקה הישראלית חלה עליהם, והמים הכלכליים, שישראל יכולה לנצל את משאבי הטבע, בעיקר לגז, והיום חיפושי גז ונפט, דייג, שטח עצום, זה כמו שטח המדינה, שטח היבשתי, אבל אנחנו לא מכירים אותו, אנחנו לא מתייחסים, או עד לפני כמה שנים לא התייחסנו אליו כמו אה, שראוי להתייחס אליו. וצריך להגיד, הוא ים מאוד עשיר, זה אומנם לא מפרץ אילת, אבל הוא ים מאוד עשיר, מאוד מגוון, מאוד מיוחד. אה, כמו שראיתם את הלוויתן שנפלט לחוף, שזה יוצא דופן, אבל אפשר לראות פה את הכרישים בחדרה, את הדקרים במים העמוקים, באמת סביבה ימית מיוחדת שאנחנו צריכים לשמור עליה. ולכן אנחנו גיבשנו תוכנית של הנקודות המרכזיות לשמור על הים התיכון עוד לפני האירוע הזה, ואני אעבור בקצרה, אבל חלק זה קשור בשמורות ימיות, וראיתי פה את חנוך שתומך בכל המהלך הזה, המהלך של קידום שמורות ימיות, צריך להגיד הייתה התקדמות בשנתיים האחרונות, אבל עוד דרך ארוכה לפנינו, לקדם הגנה בשמורות ימיות גדולות בים התיכון, דבר שלא היה קודם לכן. דבר נוסף זה רפורמה בדייג, זה כבר מהלך שאנחנו עושים מזה מספר שנים ובאמת הייתה התקדמות מאוד מרשימה וצריך להש... להשלים אותה ואחד האתגרים שזיהינו והוא רלוונטי עכשיו יותר מאשר היה קודם זה הנושא של לטפל במים הכלכליים איפה שהחקיקה הישראלית לא חלה. רק כדי להסביר שוב פעם, המים הקרובים, ה-20 קילומטר הקרובים, החקיקה הישראלית חלה שם כל הליכי התכנון חלים עליהם, אבל כל מה שקורה מעבר להם והשטח העצום שאנחנו רואים פה, בעצם זה לא מחויב בחקיקה הסביבתית והתכנונית, ולכן משרד האנרגיה הוא זה שלמעשה הריבון שם, והוא זה שמחליט, ולכן את המציאות הזאת חייבים לשנות. ניסינו לעשות שינוי מסוים אתמול, כשהיינו בדיון בבג"ץ בסביב קידוחים שמתוכננים באחד האזורים הרגישים, לצערי בית המשפט לא קיבל או המליץ לנו למשוך את העתירה בגלל שאין שם את התשתית החוקית שמאפשרת את זה. אבל צריך להגיד, בזמן ההפגנה היו פה ארגוני סביבה, מגמה ירוקה וארגונים אחרים שהיו והפגינו כי הציבור באמת רוצה שגם השטחים האלו יהיו שמורים. אם אפשר להפסיק את הקידוחים בכלל, בוודאי לא באזורים הרגישים, ולהכיל את החקיקה, צריך להגיד, הממשלה לא מקדמת את זה היום, ולכן נדרש פה מאמץ מאוד גדול לקדם את החקיקה הזאת בקדנציה הבאה. אז זה אחד האתגרים המרכזיים בים, זה להכיל את החקיקה הישראלית על המים הכלכליים, בנוסף כמובן להיערכות לזיהום, אבל שם כאמור המדינה כנראה כבר שם, בעקבות האירוע. אתגר עצום שיש לנו הוא במפרץ אילת וזה ממש קמפיין שהתחיל ממש בחודשיים האחרונים צריך להגיד שבעקבות ההסכם עם האמירויות הסכם שאנחנו מברכים עליו כמובן עם המפרציות אבל חלק מההסכם מדבר על הזרמת נפט דרך מפרץ אילת לים התיכון ומשם לאירופה וזה ייעשה באמצעות מכליות, מכליות נפט ענק, ענקיות שיגיעו למפרץ אילת, יפרקו את הנפט, יזרימו אותו בצינור לאשקלון ושם יעלה על מכליות מחדש. אנחנו כבר רואים יותר ספינות שמגיעות למפרץ אילת. ומי שעשה את ההסכם הזה זה חברת קצא"א. חברת קצא"א שאולי חלקכם מכירים עם זיהום הנפט שהיה בעברונה אבל זו חברה שהיא היום ממשלתית, אבל פועלת תחת האוצר, הרבה חלקים סודיים, הרבה דברים לא שקופים לציבור. כל ההסכם הזה הוא הסכם שעובר מתחת, בעצם הממשלה לא מעורבת בו, זה בעצם חברה ממשלת, חצי פרטית, חצי ממשלתית, חתמה הסכם, ובעצם אנחנו עלולים לשלם את המחיר הזה, ולכן זה אחד המחירים, שוו בנפשכם. שמה שקרה בים התיכון יקרה באילת, עלול להחריב את שונית האלמוגים, שצריך להגיד, היא שונית אלמוגים בעלת חשיבות ברמה העולמית הגבוהה ביותר, היא שונית אה, שהיום לא עוברת את התהליך של הבליצ'ינג, מי שמכיר, של הרס השוניות שיש במקומות אחרים בעולם. אם להתעלות באילנות גבוהים, אז המדען הראשי של רשות הטבע והגנים, 
לא מכתב מהשבוע שעבר, קובע בצורה מפורשת שאפילו דליפה קטנה של נפט זה יכול אה, לגרום להרס, הרס בלתי הפיך במערכת האקולוגית הרגישה של מפרץ אילת, ולכן אין מקום להסכם הזה. ולכן אנחנו הקמנו קואליציה של ארגונים, פה אתם רואים חלק מהארגונים, באמת כל ארגוני הסביבה ביחד עם כמובן התושבים של אילת לעצור את התוכנית הזאת, ואחד האתגרים הגדולים, אתם יכולים לראות פה, זה אתר, אתר משותף לארגונים, גם בערבית, גם באנגלית, כי ברור לנו שהאתגר הזה הוא אתגר ברמה לא רק של ישראל, אלא מעבר לזה, כי השונית הזאת כאמור היא בעלת חשיבות עולמית מהמדרגה הגבוהה ביותר. באתר אנשים יכולים להתנדב בתחומים שהם מתמחים שלהם, אז זה חלק מהאתר. פה יש עצומה שפורסמה לפני מספר שבועות, שורה ארוכה של מדענים שקוראים לעצור את היוזמה הזאת. פה ממש מכתב גם משבוע שעבר, שהוצאנו שלושה ארגונים לראש הממשלה שמדברים על הפרטיות הזאת. מכתב שהוצאנו ממש השבוע, אתם יכולים לראות פה חמישה עשר ארגוני סביבה שהוצאנו גם לראש הממשלה וגם לשרת הגנת הסביבה לעצור את היוזמה הזאת. פה הפגנה מהשבוע האחרון של תושבי אילת בזמן שראש הממשלה ביקר בעיר, ובאמת, מה שפה על הפרק זה לא פחות ממה שכתוב פה. השאלה אם אילת זה עיר שמבוססת על הטבע, עיר תיירות שנשענת על הטבע, או עיר שהופכת לעיר של נמל ותעשייה, ואני צריך להגיד שהאתגר הוא אתגר לא, לא פשוט, וזה יהיה ככה לסיום, האתגר הוא לא פשוט כי בעצם יש פה הסכם שאפשר להמשיך להתקדם איתו. אם לא תהיה החלטת ממשלה שעוצרת את זה, פשוט יגיעו עוד ועוד ספינות לאילת, עד לכמות של 150 ספינות יגיעו לאילת בשנה, והדליפה זה רק עניין של זמן, והתוצאה היא ברורה, זה הרס השונית, ולכן אנחנו חייבים פה לרכז מאמץ ולעצור את היוזמה הכל כך מסוכנת הזאת. תודה. תודה רבה, ניר. זה באמת מדאיג, very troubling, I must say. And um, just to mention that Yad and Adiv is, on, is with us on the call, and there are a resource, a good resource for you as funders, if you want to learn more about a marine environment, they have really uh, extraordinary initiatives. So they're here, Hanok and Andy, if you want to reach them. And uh, we're going to go to the next speaker, also uh, in Hebrew, Bivrit. We're going to talk about uh, the collaboration of the NGOs and the joint coalition, and how can we be also a part of that. And the presenter now is Ran Benyamini. Ran Benyamini is the executive director of Life and Environment. It's the umbrella organization for the environmental movement. And uh, Iran, we can, if you can be able to do it, we can do it in English. Unless someone has a question in English and we'll address it. Okay, no, I can do it in English. We can do it in English. In fact, I think that now the work is in two parts. There is the work of the work, which is actually a part of the co-ocean. יש גם ארגונים נוספים, אבל מבין ה-NGOs רוב העבודה נעשית דרך אקו-אושן, ואני חושב שהחדשות הטובות שיש שיתוף פעולה פנטסטי בין הארגונים. הרובד השני באמת הוא המניעה, כאשר אנחנו מדברים על מניעה, בדיוק כמו שניר פאפי דיבר עליו, באמת יש קואליציה שהיא בעצם התחילה עוד לפני כן, אבל באמת בעקבות האירועים השיתוף הפעולה התחדד וה, 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 והעבודה המשותפת השתפרה ובאמת יש עבודה באמת בשלושה תחומים עיקריים, אחד מהם מה שבעצם ניר כבר הזכיר, סוגיית קצא"א, ששם בהחלט כבר יש כבר עבודה ופעילות וגם מול הממשלה. הציר השני בתוך המניעה זה באמת סוגיית, ה, לא יודע אם אריק או ניר הזכירו, של הטלת החלטת הממשלה להיערכות במקרים כאלה ויש כבר, יש החלטת ממשלה, צריך לדאוג לכך שה, שהסוגיה תתוקצב ותצא לפועל. ובאמת המרכיב האחרון, באמת המרכיב הש... הנושא של הקידוחים, כמו במקרה של פעמחים, קידוחים נוספים. אני חושב שבנוסף לכל זאת צריך באמת להסתכל ככה בצור... על הסוגיה שניר הסתכל עליה, של המים הכלכליים, וכל הזה של יישום החוק הישראלי במים הכלכליים, שזה נשמע אולי משהו שהוא קצת גדול. אבל יש וריאציות שונות שבהחלט אפשר ללכת לכיוון הזה. 
ובאמת אני חושב שיש צורך בשני הרבדים האלה, גם בדחוף עכשיו כאן ועכשיו, והמניעה וההצלה, כפי שאריק תיאר, וגם את המניעה, ויש בהחלט גם, אני אומר גם הזדמנות, זה לא רק ההזדמנות בגלל ה... 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 התודעה הציבורית, אלא גם אני רואה שהפוליטיקאים שמים לב לתודעה הציבורית הזאת, ובאמת כבר ביום שישי התקשרו אליהם מבית הנשיא ואמרו איך אפשר לעזור, וכבר ראיתם שביבי נתניהו מתחיל לאסוף שקיות מהרצפה. בחוף הים, אז, אז אפשר להסתכל על זה בצורה גם קצת צינית, אבל בהחלט זו הזדמנות ואפשר למנף את זה. זהו. Just maybe mention that the name of the organization that, uh, that uh, you were talking about is uh, the Mediterranean People, אנשי ים התיכון, which uh, is, it, it incorporates all of us, meaning uh, uh, near, myself, uh, צלול, uh, מגמה ירוקה ואחרים שאנחנו עובדים יחד כדי לעשות את זה. אוקיי, תודה רבה. אנחנו גם נשתף קישור לאנשי הים התיכון. אני רוצה באמת לפתוח את זה לשאלות ושיחה, כי באמת יש דברים שאנחנו יכולים לעשות גם באופן פרטי, גם also as funders, and we have many ways to act. I see a comment by Yosef. Yosef Abramovich, that we have elections in a month and every virtual house party for every politician needs people on them to ask to shut down these oil and gas pipeline, pipeline plans, including renewables in it, uh, in it instead. So anyone connected to a political party, Yosef is asking uh, to add on their platform a renewable vision and fossil free um, policy and uh, actually it's a good point that Biden on his first day at the office uh, the, after the US elections actually canceled the pipeline between Canada and the states. And it was his first decision and it's still shocking that uh, Israel is considering you know, the old way of uh, working with energy. Um, so I'm opening for, um, for us to discuss and ask questions. Okay, can we hear a bit more about the emergency, emergency efforts that are going on right now and what urgent funding is needed? Who wants to answer that? Uh, question for us. Um, yeah. um, so again, it sort of goes into, I'm talking from the area, of course, of, this, of this, you know, the, the civil society, um, whatever, Possibly, of course, the government and the municipalities can provide that, that separately. So one thing that uh, we have identified is, of course, the issue of protective kits. Um, the, uh, many municipalities, the successful larger municipalities um, have, are able to provide that to every single uh, volunteer that comes and, and, and cleans things up, also for their own staff. The, the uh, smaller municipalities, the weaker municipalities in the way of, of, of economy um, uh, need in many cases to get supplies. Even this new sum of 45 million uh, shekels, it's not clear exactly, at least at this point, where it'll actually go and who will actually get what and will it reach the, the exact places that it needs to, to reach. So that's one direction Um, that's going to be needing uh, work. Um, the second thing, and, and Ruti talked about it, is that the, the rocky terrain is going to be one of our biggest challenges. Uh, it, it can't be cleaned by, by just taking any volunteer and putting them out there to clean it. It's going to need volunteers with experts, with people that will be able to help them, uh, train them, oversee the activity. And as you heard, Ruti is trying to find, uh, along with the ministry, the right chemicals uh, in order to make it happen because the tar, this was all a rush against time because the, 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 the tar absorbs, the, the, the oil absorbs water, becomes tar uh, and begins to sink. And uh, if the weather's cold, then, it, then when it hits the, the, uh, the, uh, the coast, then it stays in its form. But when it gets hot, it begins to melt into the sand and on the rocks. And then when it hardens, it becomes something that's very, very difficult. 
You have to use chisels and all kinds of other things in order to be able to clean that. So that's going to be an effort as well. Uh, another thing that we're discussing is um, uh, the monitoring. Um, the fact that um, uh, at this point, um, we've, we believe there are ways of being able to identify um, uh, the, the existence of oil in the water before it hits uh, the coastline. By the way, we, um, we launched a glider um, a, along with the Ministry of Environment a, a, two days ago. A, and on that glider, the glider is like a, a missile that's gonna go along, along the coast of Israel. And it has a sensor that will be able to give us an exact reading of the components of oil um, in, the, in the water. It'll be able to help us understand when you can open up the, um, the, the beaches for the general public uh, and so on. So um, I'm being asked, uh, I see about the kit. The kit, uh, again, we're trying to, there's always that conflict. We don't want to in incorporate too many materials that are, are single use and then cause another problem. So um, what we've identified, a kit basically costs about 150 shekels a kit. Um, a, it, some volunteers use it once, but we try to uh, recycle it to many uh, uh, volunteers as much as we can. Um, uh, and the last part that I talked about is, um, you know, we, we definitely want to make sure that um, a, we get to all the communities. Uh, just in one of the pictures that you saw, you saw volunteers from Jisra Zarka. Um, and, and it just is a, it, we want to reach every single community and be able to help them um, in what they need specifically. They may need training, they may need supplies, in all those things we of course would like to help. הייתי רוצה... תודה, אריק, ניר. כן. ניר, אם אתה יכול בתשובה שלך גם לשלב, אם אתה יודע, what are the consequences or... מתקני התפלה. כן, for the desalination. מתקני התפלה שפזורים לאורך כל החוף שלנו, הם שואבים מעומק המים ויש שם מעקב צמוד לגבי איכות המים. וכרגע כל המתקנים עובדים וכרגע אין להם סכנה. אבל כבר היו בעבר זיהומים באשקלון שמתקני התפלה נסגרו בגלל זיהום, אז בהחלט יש סיכון פוטנציאלי, כרגע הוא לא, הוא לא משבית את מתקני התפלה, אבל זה סיכון שצריך לקחת בחשבון. אני רוצה לדבר באמת על הצורך הגדול באילת סביב הנושא של קצא"א. צריך להגיד, יש שם קואליציה עם המון ארגונים, אבל אין שם תקציב. וצריך להגיד, פה האתגר הוא מאוד גדול, אנחנו פועלים בכל הכיוונים. גם משפטיים, אבל אין פה, אין פה ערוץ משפטי קל, צריך להגיד את זה, אנחנו ננסה למצות אותו, אבל אין ערוץ משפטי קל, זה בעיקר להשפיע על המדיניות, כמו שאמרתי קודם. אנחנו מזמינים עכשיו, רוצים להזמין חוות דעת מקצועיות, אבל זה מותנה בתקציבים, לראות, ללמוד מהעולם, מה קורה בעולם, סיכונים, השלכות סביבתיות, בריאות על הציבור, אז חוות דעת מקצועיות, פעילות ציבורית, פעילות בתקשורת. לכן הצורך פה הוא חשוב, צריך להגיד כל תשומת הלב הציבורית היא לים התיכון ולהתמודדות עם הניקוי והמדינה גם הולכת לשם, אבל אילת כמובן המדינה לא תעזור לנו ולכן פה בהחלט אנחנו צריכים, אנחנו גם הולכים לקראת גיוס המונים, אנחנו רוצים לצאת ממש בשבוע שבועיים הקרובים בגיוס המונים כדי שיאפשר לנו לעשות את כל הפעולות שאנחנו מתכננים במסגרת הקואליציה וכמובן אם יש רצון, אז נשמח כמובן. יש כאן, תודה, יש כאן שאלה גם לחיים וסביבה. ערן, אני מקווה שאתה רואה. תראה, the deeper terrain is of course a longer term need. What are the short term emergency needs above the beyond and beyond the 45 million from the government? Can, can we expect that at some point in the near future someone will compile such a list, and if so, who is taking responsibility to this, life and environment, how is it going to work? Iran, you can also speak in English. I want to jump in. Um, this is Marla. Um, first of all, I see Andreas Weil on the call. Andreas was actually, is a JFN member, and he was the founder, single-handed founder of Echo Ocean. So thank you so much, Andreas, and so glad that you could join us. We also have Ilana Neustadter, who's on the call, who is a board member of Echo Ocean. Uh, again, thank you, Ilana. And I also want to thank Dorit, 
Carlene, who was uh, the chairperson of this forum for many years, um, and was really your idea to have this emergency meeting. So I'm Marla, I'm the current co-chair, but I really, again, I really appreciate it, Dorit. Uh, Gil, thank you also for organizing. Uh, Gil has been working with uh, Sigal as a consultant to the forum. I wanna jump in on this funding. I'm a committed green funder, and many of you here are committed funders in the environment. But I'm also very delighted that many of you are not actually funders in the, in the environment, but you're mobilizing now and want to help. And so what we have been talking about with Iran is setting up a fund through life and environment for both streams that Nir was talking about, both to, to coordinate emergency efforts and also for the long-term strategic efforts to really hit the policy that needs to be changed. And so we are proposing that foundations uh, appeal to your boards and come up with a fund. I actually would like to kind of propose that there, there's a, some kind of a pledge out there that even non-funders in the environment consider making a 2%, 3% of your overall grant making to the environment as the kind of insurance policy for all of our lives. And then since you don't necessarily have dedicated staff to it, we're going to have a platform uh, most likely within life and environment uh, that that money can then be funneled both for emergency needs and for long-term needs. I personally um, believe very much in policy. So I'm uh, finalizing a proposal with life and environment uh, to hopefully partially fund a lobbyist for the environmental movement. If you can believe this, there is no overall lobbyist for the environmental movement. Definitely Haganat Teteva has a lobbyist who I met yesterday in the Bagats. Um, she's a one person show. I mean, it's way too much. Adam Teva Bedin has a lobbyist as well. Salul. Uh, there are people working on advocacy, but there's not one overall lobbyist for the environmental movement. Um, and so we're working on um, trying to make that happen. So we would love funders, this is a call of funders, we would love for you to jump in both for the emergency and for the long term, whether or not you're a committed green funder or whether or not it's just your insurance policy. So Iran, you can uh, tell us if you have some details about how that fund can happen. אני אני אומר שיש יש 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 מתה שבעצם אנחנו שם ריכזנו הרבה מאוד צרכים ודרישות אנחנו למעשה גם כן מחליטים גם איזה איזה צרכים ודרישות אנחנו מעבירים לאיזה גופים מכיוון שכמובן הרשימת הצרכים היא מאוד מאוד ארוכה מכתב האחרון שאנחנו הוצאנו לממשלה להתמקד בשלושה תחומים כמו שאני הזכרתי אותם מקודם אבל כמובן יש הרבה יותר מה, מהשלושה תחומים הללו אני חייב לציין גם כן שלהערכתי ובניגוד לדברים אחרים חלק מהדרישות שלנו יש להם סיכוי גבוה להצליח מסיבות פוליטיות כאלה ואחרות אני רק ככה נותן לכם לדוגמה הסיפור של קצא בעיניי דווקא בגלל שזה מגיע לאילת ונכון שאילת לא מעניינת אבל, אבל בעצם האילתים מעניינים את, את בנימין נתניהו ואת הליכוד מכל מיני סיבות פנים מפלגתיות ולכן אני חושב שיש ש... יש, אני יכול כמובן, אם מישהו ירצה, נשלח לו גם את המכתב שנשלח וגם uh, רשימה יותר ארוכה של דברים, אבל אני חושב שהפעולה מול הממשלה היא פעולה שיש לה סיכוי, וזה חייב להיות פעולה מול הממשלה, כי חלק מהדברים גם דורשים משאבים מאוד מאוד גדולים. אוקיי, תודה רבה. יש איזה שאלה על ההתנהלות של הפישים בקרקעות במדיטרניאן. יש להם אפשרות להתנהלות של הפישים בקרקעות? maritime areas? I guess Neil can answer that. כמו שציינתי, אחד האתגרים שאנחנו עוסקים בהם בשנים האחרונות, שוב פעם, גם פה בתמיכה, אני מקווה שזה בסדר שאני אומר לך, נור, בתמיכה שלי יד הנדיב, זה הנושא של הדייג, וקודמה רפורמה מאוד מקיפה אחרי עשרות שנים שלא הייתה, רפורמה בכל, בכל נושא הדייג בים התיכון, חלקה הושלם. אבל היא כל הזמן גם מאתגרים אותה מחדש ומנסים לפתוח אותה ולכן המלאכה עדיין לא נשלמה אבל בהחלט הים התיכון הוא סובל מדייג יתר, הים התיכון בכלל אבל גם החוף שלנו כאמור נעשו שורה של פעולות חשובות אבל אנחנו צריכים להמשיך בהן כדי שבאמת נגיע לאיזון בר קיימא של הדייג בים התיכון. אוקיי, okay, תודה רבה ניר אני חושב שאנחנו ננצל את הזמן שנשאר לנו באמת לעשות איזשהו סיכום קצר, just a short, uh, unless 
people have really urgent questions they want to ask. Um, I think uh, there are two conclusions that I take from this discussion. There's an urgent need for collaborative work, both on the ground, which is now happening, and both by funders in some cases for emergencies and also for the long term. And I'm happy that Marley is taking the lead to create such a platform. And I think it's a good opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to examine this option. And you're very welcome to be in touch with Marla, with myself, with Sigal, just to, you know, if you need a good advice on where to help now specifically, or if you want to talk about the broader, the broader aspect of joining forces together, of course, you can uh, be in touch with the organizations that were invited, Echo Ocean mostly leading the effort on the ground, and um, the SPNI, Life and Environment, leading the coalition to change policy. So I really have to say to say thank you, first of all, Ari, Knir, Eran, and also we'll send our thank you to Ruti for doing such an amazing work on the ground. I personally went to the beach and helped with the cleaning. It was just, you know, heartbreaking. And I think people will be, I think the, the public is uh, concerned about it because People are expecting to go outside after COVID and you know go back to the second home for many Israelis, which is the beach. And I think it's a good opportunity. There are also elections. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But there, there are many opportunities to do something now. This is an event that it's on a big scale that didn't happen before. And we should think how to leverage it. And this is my message uh, now. I, I wanna, I wanna, yeah, I want to pass it over to Sigal and Marla just, to have final. Yeah, I just have two quick remarks. One, as both Ruthie and everyone else here was speaking, the, in, to a large extent, we don't even know the extent of the damage. And it will unfold during the next few weeks and months and maybe even longer than that. So if good, um, relevant information that opens on our eyes to the situation um, is... Uh, accessible for us in a few weeks time, we'll definitely be open to hold another briefing like this with updated information so we could see how we could gear all of our energy here to focused efforts to make a difference. That's number one. Number two, same as we're holding this briefing, we can organize briefings on any issue you might be interested in regarding to the environment in Israel. So use the Green Funders Forum as a resource. You can always call Marla, Gil, or myself, email us with issues that you care about, and we'd be happy to either share information that we have with you or organize a briefing like this that we really did in 48 hours and we had almost 50 participants on the call. So when things are burning and people care, we think that having good, reliable information and being able to really understand what's going on on the ground is critical to making good decisions. So we'd like to invite you and, and treat this as an open invitation from here towards the future to use us and take advantage of this resource. And, uh, and lastly, on my end, before I hand it over to Marla, I want to thank you all for joining us. And of course, Gil, for organizing and our speakers, Arik and Nir and Iran and Ruti is not here for taking the time and preparing us. Um, hi, I actually see another really important point in the chat by from David Wyman about wanting to know the security and economic issues regarding the Elat Ashkelon pipeline. Can somebody quickly address that or else uh, say who we can contact afterwards? Nir, are you the one? ולכן הם רוצות להגיע למפרץ אילת ולהזרים את הנפט דרך הצינור הקיים כבר משנות ה-60 לאשקלון ומשם לכיוון של אירופה. אז האינטרס שלהם הוא אינטרס כלכלי, האינטרס של קצא"א והאוצר יש פה אינטרס כלכלי, המדינה לא פורסם כמה, אבל מן הסתם יהיה לה רווח כלכלי, אבל כאמור הסיכון פה הוא סיכון כל כך גדול, כל כך בעייתי למפרץ אילת, שאין שום אפשרות לתת לזה, זאת אומרת אי אפשר גם להגן, אי אפשר להגן בצורה מוחלטת, אין שום טכנולוגיה שמאפשרת להגן אפס תקלות, ואנחנו לא יכולים להרשות לעצמנו אפילו תקלה קטנה, ולכן צריך להתנגד לזה בצורה גורפת לפרויקט הזה.
I just want to say just a quick comment. Yossi Abramovich mentioned that there is a big uh, march on the 19th of March with, uh, I guess it's the coalition uh, on climate change and will probably tackle this issue as well. So you're welcome to follow up on that, but... Uh, and I think we should also uh, say kolakavod to Yossi for his nomination for a Nobel Prize for Peace on his activity uh -huh. in Africa. <laughs> Uh, okay, and I'm also just going to say our next actual scheduled program is part of the JFN conference, which will be Monday, March 15th. Uh, we're going to have Stephen Bronfman speaking, as well as uh, Valerie from C the Cummings Foundation. And I, uh, those are two extremely uh, committed funders from the world in the area of the environment. And when I was speaking to one of them, uh, the person was talking about their very limited budget in the environment. It was only several million dollars. And again, I wanna just add that the budgets of the organizations that we're talking about here are altogether like one million, one and a half million dollars altogether. So I want you to know again, as most of you are non-green funders, a small amount relative to your overall budget actually makes a huge year. We're talking about a lobbyist for the environmental movement. We're talking about $100,000 total for that position per year. So you can really make a difference um, with a relatively small amount of money for the bigger foundations that are on the call and for the smaller foundations that are on the call also. Every little bit, you heard how much those kits cost. So, and again, we're willing to be the kind of cooperative effort to put together a platform for that pledge that I'm talking about. And I want to really work on putting that forward to the overall JFN membership as well outside of Israel, that we can't just worry about every other issue in Israel. They're all interconnected, whether or not you're interested in poverty or education or youth at risk. Everything comes down to the environment. We're also really happy to have on the call Tali Yarif Michel, who's actually the chairperson of the Forum of Foundations here in Israel and as the representative of the Bracha Foundation, is actually one of the biggest environmental funders in Israel right now, along with uh, Yad HaNadiv and the Seba, the Seba Trust as well. So we have some excellent examples and uh, we're glad to try to, whatever we can do to mentor you along. Um, I think that's really it. I'm very happy uh, again that we were all able to put this together so quickly. Um, there's a lot of information to cover. So please uh, feel free to reach out to us um, to be a resource. That's what we're really here for. I really believe in collaboration and we want to do that for you. So thank you very much. This is really a time for action and we look forward uh, you know, to take this opportunity with both hands and do good and you know, prevent catastrophes now and in the future. So thank you very much to everyone. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.